The Congregational Principle, Chapter 5. This talk, eventually one of the most popular arrows in my parap peripatetic speaker's quiver, began life in a slightly altered form as an essay in the main scholar. The beginning of an, of an American solution to our school problem. These are surrealistic times. The scientific school establishment continues to float plans for further centralization in the form of national standards, a national curriculum, and improved national standardized testing. Magical promises are everywhere. Machines are the answer. Massive interventions are the answer. New forms of preschooling are the answer. Baseball bats, bullhorns, and padlocks are the answer. In the face of a century and a half of searching for it unsuccessfully, nobody seems to doubt for a minute that there is an answer. One answer. The one right answer. Perhaps you agree. Perhaps not. But if some lingering doubt exists in your mind about the possibility of a central prescription ever touching the school disease, then come with me for a while back to colonial New England, where a different kind of theory of institutions existed, a theory which might lead to the best kind of rethinking reform, where serious mistakes are self-limiting and, in historical terms, quickly foreclosed by natural market mechanisms. Come with me to the coasts of colonial New England, to towns like Salem and Marblehead, Framingham and Dedham, Wellfleet and Provincetown. Consider a different perspective that grew out of the soil of a new world, a perspective that shocked other nations with the productivity of its genius. This new system began with the first Puritan church at Salem, organized in 1629 by the so-called Salem Procedure. No higher-up was around to approve the selection of the church authorities, so the congregation took that responsibility upon themselves. With that simple act, they took power that had traditionally belonged to some certified expert and placed it in the hands of people who went to church. That was the sole criterion of governance, that a voter took going to church seriously and joined a congregation as evidence. It was an act of monumental localism. For the next 200 years, the simple shedding of traditional authority corroded the monopoly power of the state and church to broadcast uniform versions of the truth. Each separate congregation took a vigorous role in particularizing its own parish through debate of lay members, not through the centralization inherent in pronouncement by outside authority. Each separate congregation took on responsibility for solving its own problems, whether of education, economics or doctrine, rather than submitting to the old authority of England or the new aristocracy of expertise. Last fall I spoke in the town of Dedham, at a church built in 1638, only nine years after the Arbella brought the nonconformists to Boston. The church I spoke in was Unitarian Universalist, but had originally been congregational. White Spire, Strikingly plain, graceful lines, the simplicity and the rightness of congregational church architecture is absolutely unmistakable, un, uh, sorry, unmistakable, remarkable, and uniform. You may or may not be aware that the style of worship that went with this style of architecture was the original and exclusive religion of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. From the Salem procedure until 1834, over 200 years of what seems on the surface to be a one right way religion. You were either a Congregationalist or you weren't anything you dared speak of in public, at least without risk of being shunned, persecuted, or even burned at the stake. So far, this sounds even worse than the school monopoly that ruins us, doesn't it? These Congregationalists were so jealously protective of their monopoly that 170 years ago, when Lyman Beecher got word that Unitarians were on their way out from the bowels of hell, he rode through the streets just like Paul Revere, warning, The Unitarians are coming! The Unitarians are coming! You'll gather Parson Beecher wasn't exactly thrilled with their advent. But an amazing thing happened over the next century. The Congregationalists slowly changed their minds without being forced to do so. By the end of the 1800s, the Unitarians were, were well respected throughout New England. Most people think of colonial New England as embodying the greatest period of conformity this country has ever seen. 
but the nature of congregationalism hides a very great irony. Structurally, this way of life demands individuality, are they our own, oops, demands individuality, not regimentation. The service is almost free of liturgy, emphasizing local preaching about local issues. This virtually guarantees dissonance inside the congregation. The constant struggle for clarity by every church member acting as his or her own priest, his or her own expert, invariably leads to progress toward truth. Why do I say that? Well, what I've just described is the process that Aristotle and Karl Marx and Thomas Hobbes and any of a large number of creative thinkers have called the dialectic. The congregational procedure was dialectical down to its roots, in a way acutely hostile to hierarchical thinking. Central planners of any period despise the dialectic because it gets in the way of efficiently broadcasting one right way to do things. Half a century ago, Bertrand Russell remarked that the United States was the only major country on earth that deliberately avoided teaching its children to think dialectically. He was talking about 20th century America, of course, the land of compulsory government schooling, not the New England of congregational distinction. Did you wonder where Yankees got their lasting reputation for stubbornness, orneriness, and shrewd hair-splitting? Now you know. Roger Williams saw as clearly as any person of his time, and recognized the inevitable connection between dissonance and the quality of life. You can't have one without the other. Much recent scholarship has shown the towns of Massachusetts in the 17th century not to be uniform at all, but to be laboratories of local choice and style. Each had considerable flexibility to deviate from what might have been central government rule. The town of Dedham, where I spoke last fall, drew its original settlers from East Anglia in England, a place that favored private ownership and individual choice. The institutions of East Anglia quickly established themselves in the New World, too. On the other hand, Sudbury, the town next to Dedham, had been populated by a colonist of by colonists of Saxon and Celtic background, who traditionally shared their work. Just as they had done in Britain, they held open fields in common, Amer in, common in America. In colonial Massachusetts, then, there was creative tension between the common culture of the region and the local village culture, like tension in music or poetry between a regular pattern and, a creative, and creative departures from it, this tension among the small towns and among the different congregations, and inside each separate congregation, produced an astonishing energy, a fertile and idiosyncratic peculiarity that characterized the particular genius that distinguished colonial Massachusetts. Now I want us to examine something that seems embarrassing in New England's civil life, and yet paradoxically I think it hides a secret of great power which the social engineers who built and maintain our government monopoly schools are forced to overlook. Each town was able to exclude people it didn't like. People were able to choose whom they wanted to work with, to sort themselves into a living curriculum that worked for them. The words of the first Dedham Charter catch this feeling perfectly. The original settlers wanted to and did shut out people whose, di people whose dispositions do not suit us, whose society will be hurtful to us. So in a funny way, these early towns functioned like selective clubs or colleges, like MIT and Harvard do today, narrowing human differences down to a range that could be managed by them humanely. If you consider the tremendous stresses the dialectical process sets up anyway, where all people are their own priests, their own final masters, it's hard to see how a congregational society can do otherwise. If you have to accept everyone, no matter how hostile they may be to your own personality, philosophy, or mission, then an operation would quickly become paralyzed by fatal disagreements. The common causes and purposes that mark human association at its best would then degrade into those few innocuous undertakings that have no political dimension, if such can be found. It's a subtle distinction. Living dialectically, as the New Englanders did, produces spectacular accomplishments and brings out strong qualities of character and mind in individuals, but it isn't possible to manage where the whole catalogue of human beings is thrown together haphazardly or forced together as it is in government monopoly school life. 
To prevent chaos in these places, management must aim, by hook or by crook, to make everything, time, space, texts, and procedures, as uniform as possible. The Greeks had a story about a man who did just that. His name was Procustus. He cut or stretched travelers to fit his guest bed. The system worked perfectly, but it played havoc with the traveler. These New Englanders invented a system where people who wanted to live and work together could do so. Yet the whole region seemed to prosper in wonderful ways, materially, intellectually, and socially. It was almost as if by taking care of your own business, you succeeded in some magical fashion in taking care of, of pubic business, I think it was public business, pubic business too. The habits of self-reliance, self-respect, fearlessness, democracy, and local loyalty produced good citizens. Government monopoly schools use a different blueprint these days, of course. People are drawn willy-nilly out of large catchment areas and dumped together into compartments according to similar scores on standardized tests. There they are exhorted to perform and behave according to the specifications of strangers. Christopher Lash writes in The True and Only Heaven, the capacity for loyalty is stretched too thin when it tries to attach itself to the hypothetical solidarity of the human race. It needs to attach itself to specific people and specific places, not to an abstract ideal of universal human rights. We love particular men and women, not humanity in general. This catches a piece of what is wrong with compulsory schools as large as New England towns, Schools that don't allow any choice of curricula, philosophy, or companions. Wendell Berry catches another piece of it in a letter to a magazine e editor. I don't think global thinking is futile. I think it is impossible. You can't think about what you don't know, and nobody knows this planet. Some people know a little about a few small parts of it. The people who think globally do so by abstractly and statistically reducing the globe to quantities. Political tyrants and industrial exploiters have done this most successfully. Their concepts and their greed are abstract, and simplicity to acts. Sorry, their concepts and their greed are abstract, and their abstractions lead with terrifying directness and simplicity to acts that are, invari that are invariably destructive. If you want to do good and preserving acts, you must think and act locally. The effort to do good acts gives the global game away. You can't do a good act that is global. A good act to be good must be acceptable to what Alexander Pope called the genius of the place. This calls for local knowledge, local skills, and local love that virtually none of us has, and that none of us can get by thinking globally. We can get it only by a local fidelity that we would have to maintain through several lifetimes. I don't wish to be loved by people who don't know me. If I were a planet, I would feel exactly the same way. Local skill, local knowledge, local love, and local fidelity were what the forge of Congregationalism in New England produced best, but there was a negative side to this localism as well. The religious discrimination of early New England was a way of ensuring enough local harmony that a community of people who suited each other could arise bearing a common vision. Here is a scene from 300 years ago in the town of Dedham, Massachusetts, which could have been witnessed from the very church where I spoke. Three Quaker women are stripped to the waist and whipped the length of town, tied to the tail of a cart. It would be an understatement to say that such treatment underlined the fact that the Quaker disposition was not one of those suited to Dedham. But then, for that matter, for that matter neither was the Presbyterian disposition. John Milton himself had written that the new presbyter is but old priest writ large, and so all Presbyterians were driven off to the wilds of New Jersey, where they founded Princeton. Of course, it was equally bad for your health to be a Catholic in Dedham, or to be a leveler, a digger, or a Hutterite. In this detestable fashion, Dedham was able to enjoy 234 years of religious purity before its congregational monopoly was broken. Well, what does this all mean? Just this. The negative side of local choice is very easy to see, and even very easy to predict. We see it illustrated in the example of colonial Dedham. But the whole matter is a good deal more complicated than assigning a bad grade to religious discrimination or to any other type of social choice that prescribes and limits a particular kind of human association. 
For instance, where could we begin to look for an explanation of how these people grew gradually more tolerant and came to accept all forms of religion? They even changed their conservative ways to the point where Massachusetts gained a national reputation as the most liberal state in the Union. That's quite a flip-flop to account for in the absence of compulsion, intimidation, or potent enabling legislation, isn't it? How did Dedham and the rest of those towns teach themselves to reform, without experts making them do it, and without central intervention? Remember, they only allowed the practitioners of one religion to vote, but they changed, and nobody forced them to do it. Something mysterious inside the structure of congregationalism worked to have them abandon some of the exclusivity and that adherence to biblical elite dogma had taught them. I am certain that something was nearly unconditional local choice, and it was self-correcting. Because the town churches did not team up to present an institutional orthodoxy that made each town just like another, as government monopoly schools do today, Error in one church could be countered by its correction in another. As long as people had the choice to vote with their feet, the free market punished severe errors by leaving a congregation empty, just as it could reward a good place by filling it up. And even if enough rotten people were found to make a rotten town or a rotten congregation, as long as there was no machinery in place for that one idea to compel all others to bow down before it, the human damage it could cause was strictly limited. Only when situations exist out of which a central orthodoxy can arise, like a pyramid, is there a real danger that some central poison can poison us all. Yes, the negative aspects of local choice are easy to spot, and the overwhelming argument in its, in its favor, that without it the genius of democracy cannot exist, is hard to see. Because there is plenty of local tyranny as well, the temptation is to cede power to a central authority in the name of fairness, to manage some best way for all from central headquarters. That's what a national curriculum is supposed to be for our schools, a rational, fair way to legislate bad schooling out of existence. A national curriculum would never have allowed Dedham or Sudbury or Framingham or Wellfleet to develop as they did. That would have been dangerous, unpredictable, divisive. No. They would have been regulated centrally, as our schools are today, even without a national curriculum and national standards. And here comes the dialectic. The experience of our centrally planned century has not been very good for most people. According to some, the planet itself is in jeopardy. And things legislated out of existence, like alcohol and drug abuse or racism, don't seem to go away as religious exclusivity went away naturally in New England under a regime of local choice. Instead, law appears to give bad habits an injection of virulent new life. Think of the great progressive victories won in courts because social engineers were unable to build popular consensus, or were unwilling to wait. Affirmative action, desegregation, restrictions on graphic sexual imagery available at the local newsstand, various women's rights issues, and so on. Are these victories for the groups the courts sought to protect, or do these victories hold the same value they would have had they been won through change in the social consensus? By most parameters, the plight of black Americans, for example, now seems to be worse than it was in the 1960s. Furthermore, a mean-spiritedness seems to exist everywhere including in our schools, that pours contempt and neglect on further efforts to give the descendants of slavery a hand. The predicament of women is a little trickier to see, but if sharply accelerated rates of suicide, heart disease, emotional illness, sterility, and other pathological conditions are an indicator, the admission of women en masse to the unisex workplace is not an unmixed blessing. Further, some disturbing evidence exists that the income of working couples in 1990 has only slightly more purchasing power than the income of the average working man did in 1910. In effect, two laborers are now being purchased for the price of one, an outcome Adam Smith or David Ricardo might have predicted. And an unseen social cost of all of this has been the destruction of family life, the loss of home as sanctuary or haven, and the bewilderment of children who, since infancy, have been raised by strangers. <clears throat>
does central legal intimidation produce the social results it promises? Not so long ago, narcotics were legal in the United States. While they were always a pernicious nuisance, they never became an epidemic before legislation pro prohibiting their use came into existence. Is it possible that compelling people to do something guarantees they will do it poorly, with a bad will, or indifferently, unless you are willing, as the army is, to suspend most human rights and use any degree of intimidation necessary? And if the latter is the only way that compulsion can produce results, what is the human value of using it if it diminishes the quality of human life? Multiple prohibitions of choice in the matter of education are now enforced by law, enshrining an exclusive bureaucracy of certified teachers and administrators, and literally hundreds of invisible agencies necessary to maintain the institution of government monopoly schooling. Defying the lessons of the market, this psychopathic megalith has grown more and more powerful in spite of colossal failures to educate throughout its history. It succeeds in surviving only because it employs the police power of the state to fill its hollow classrooms. It prohibits local choice and variety, and because of this prohibition has had a hideous effect on our national moral fabric. The effect the national prohibition of alcohol by legislation has had on social cohesion and common values is an object lesson too recent to forget, I hope. And compared to the prohibitions that compulsory government monopoly schooling imposes on the children and families of a nation, alcohol prohibition is a minor episode. By preventing a free market in education, a handful of social engineers backed by the industries that profit from compulsory schooling, teacher colleges, textbook publishers, materials suppliers, and others, has ensured that most of our children will not have an education, even though they may be thoroughly schooled. Divorced from religion, the congregational principle is a psychological force propelling individuals to reach their maximum potential when working in small groups of people with whom they feel in harmony. If you think about this, you wonder what purpose is achieved by arranging things any other way. The Congregationalists understood profoundly that good things happen to the human spirit when it is left alone. The best immediate evidence I have to offer that leaving people alone to work out their own local destinies is a splendid idea is the curious sociology of my presence as a speaker in Dedham last year. There, in a community that had whipped half-naked Quaker women, stood I, a Roman Catholic, with a Scots Presbyterian wife, accompanied by my good friend Roland, half pagan, half Jewish, in a Unitarian Universalist church that had once been congregational. No act of the Massachusetts legislature made that possible. No pronouncement of the Supreme Court. People learned to be neighbors in Dedham because for 300 years they were allowed real choices, including the choice to make their own mistakes. Everyone learned a better way to deal with difference than exclusion because they had time to think about it and to work it through. Time measured in generations. But if they had been ordered to change, ordered as other immigrants were, to change their behavior and to abandon their culture in compulsory schools set up for that purpose, I think what would have happened is this. Some of them would have seemed to change, but would have harbored such powerful resentments at being deprived of choice that some way to exact vengeance would have evolved. And most of the group deprived of choice in custom and family and roots would have reacted a variety of ways to these social pressures, would have gone quietly insane or become simplified people, fit to haul stones to build someone else's pyramids, perhaps, or to watch television's simplified fantasies, but fit for little else. Despite the lip service we have continued to pay to local choice ever since congregational days, our schools are centrally planned and already have a national curriculum in place, mediated by the textbook publishing industry and the standardized training of teachers. That our schools have failed spectacularly to give our children the education we want for them, or the selves we want, or to deliver on the dream of the democratic, classless society we still yearn for is obvious enough. What we miss is the logic of our failure. 
By allowing the imposition of direction from centers far beyond our control, we have time and again missed the lesson of the congregational principle. People are less than whole unless they gather themselves voluntarily into groups of souls in harmony. Gathering themselves to pursue individual, family, and community dreams consistent with their private humanity is what makes them whole. Only slaves are gathered by others. And these dreams must be written locally, because to exercise any larger ambition without such a base is to lose touch with the things which give life meaning. Self, family, friends, work, and intimate community. There seem to me to be two official ways to look at the state of education in the United States these days, both of them wrong. First, we conceive it to be an engineering problem that can be made to yield to a pragmatic instrumental approach. From this vantage point, there is a simple right and wrong way of schooling. Never the thousand private individual possibilities the New England Congregationalists might have believed in. Second, we look upon schooling as if it were a character in a continuous courtroom drama, a drama wherein we search for the villains who have prevented our kids from learning. Bad teachers, poor textbooks, incompetent administrators, evil politicians, ill-trained parents, bad children, whoever the villains may be, we shall find them, indict them, arraign them, prosecute them, perhaps even execute them. Then things will be okay. Out of these two wrong-headed ways of looking at education have grown enormous industries that claim power to cure mass education of its frictions or of its demons in exchange for treasure. Into this carnival of magical thinking has come a parade of profit-seekers, analysts, consultants, researchers, academic houses, writers, advisors, columnists, textbook committees, school boards, testing corporations, journalists, teachers' colleges, state departments of education, monitors, coordinators, manufacturers, certified teachers and administrators, television programs, and hordes of school-related businesses, all parasitic growths of the government monopoly over the school concept. To many of us, the greatest attraction of social engineering and antisocial demonologies is that both, at bottom, promise a quick fix. That has always been the dark side of the American dream. The search for an easy way out, a belief in magic, the endless parade of promises that constitutes the heart of American advertising, one of the largest of our national enterprises, testifies to the deep well of superstition in our national foundation, which has been institutionalized in the advertising business. Easy money, easy health, easy beauty, easy education, if only the right incantation can be found. Lurking behind the magic, is an image of people as machinery that can be built and repaired. This is our Calvinist legacy calling to us over the centuries, saying that the world and all its living variety is just machinery, not the very hard, not very hard to adjust if we put sentimentality aside and fire the villains, either symbolically or with actual bonfires, depending on the century. School reform to most of us is an engineer reaching for the right wrench, or Perry Mason finding the clue he needs to nail the bad guy. Ultimately, how we think about social problems depends on our philosophy of human nature. What we think people are, what we think they are capable of, what the purposes of human existence may be, if any. If people are machines, then school can only be a way to make these machines more reliable. The logic of machines dictates that parts be uniform and entertain interchangeable, all operations time-constrained, predictable, economical. Does this sound to you like the schools you attended, that your children attend? The Civil War unfortunately demonstrated beyond the shadow of a doubt both the financial and social utility of regimentation. But while this notion of people as machines has been around for thousands of years, its effective reign has only been operational since the end of World War I. American education teaches by its methodology that people are machines. Bells ring, circuits open and close, energy flows or is constricted, qualities are reduced to a numbering system. A plan is followed of which the machine parts know nothing. 
Octavio Paz from Mexico, the 1990 winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, has this to say about our schools. In the North American system, men and women are subjected from childhood to an inexorable process. Certain principles contained in brief formulas are endlessly repeated by the press, radio, television, churches, and especially schools. A person imprisoned by these schemes is like a plant in a flower pot too small for it. He cannot grow or mature. This sort of conspiracy cannot help but provoke violent individual rebellions. We cannot grow or mature like plants in two little flower pots. We are addicted to dependency. In the current national crisis of maturity, we seem to be waiting for the teacher to tell us what to do. But the teacher never comes to do that. Bridges collapse. Men and women sleep on the streets. Bankers cheat. Goodwill decays. Families betray each other. The government lies as a matter of policy. Corruption, shame, sickness, and sensationalism are everywhere. No school has a curriculum to provide the quick fix. The old Congregationalists would have been able to put their finger at once on the reason pyramidal societies, such as the one our monopoly form of schooling sustains, must always end in apathy and disorganization. At the root, they are based on the lie that there is one right way in human affairs, and that experts can be awarded the permanent direction of the enterprise of education. It is a lie because the changing dynamics of time and situation and locality render expertise irrelevant and obsolete shortly after it is anointed. Monopoly schooling has been the chief training institution of the Hive Society. It certifies permanent experts who enjoy privileges of status unwarranted by the results they produce. Because these privileges, once achieved, will not willingly be given over, whole apparatuses of privilege have been fashioned that are impregnable to change. Even under the severest criticism, they grow larger and more dangerous because they nourish important parts of our political and economic system. In the most literal sense, they are impossible to reform because they have ceased to be human, having been transformed into abstract structures of superb efficiency, independent of lasting human control survival mechanisms. This is not a devil you can wrestle with, as Daniel Webster did with Old Scratch but one that has to be starved to, de starved to death by depriving it of victims. Monopoly schooling is the major cause of our loss of national and individual identity. Having institutionalized the division of social classes and acted as an agent of caste, it is repugnant to our founding myths and to the reality of our founding period. Its strength arises from many quarters, the anti-child, anti-family stream of history being one, but it draws its greatest power from being a natural adjunct to the kind of commercial economy we have that requires permanently dissatisfied consumers. It's time to stop. This system doesn't work, and it's one of the causes of our world coming apart. No amount of tinkering will make the school machine work to produce educated people. Education and schooling are, as we all have experienced, mutually exclusive terms. In 1930, 60 long years ago, Thomas Briggs, delivering the English lecture at Harvard, charged that the nation's great investment in secondary education has shown no respectable achievement. Two decades later, in 1951, a survey made of 30,000 Los Angeles school children discovered that 75% of 8th graders couldn't find the Atlantic Ocean on a map, and most of them couldn't calculate 50% of 36. From my personal experience, I stand witness that the situation is certainly no better today. What on earth is going on? Any genuine debate would have to grapple with the uniform failure of every type of government monopoly school. With the addition of television, the destructive power of schooling is now awesome and thoroughly out of control. The television institution, very similar to the structure of mass schooling, has expanded so successfully that all the former escape routes are now blocked. We have destroyed the minds and characters of the nation's children by preempting their youth, removing their choices. We will pay a huge price in lost humanity for this crime for another century, even if a way is found to overturn the pyramid. 
Getting rid of the monopoly is the beginning of an answer. What is there to do? Look to Dedham, to Sudbury, to Marblehead, and to Provincetown, all different, yet all capable of meeting their community's needs. Turn your back on national solutions and toward communities of families as successful laboratories. Let us turn inward until we master the first directive of any philosophy worthy of the name, know thyself. Understand that successful communities know the truth of the maxim, good fences make good neighbors, while at the same time being able to recognize, respect, understand, appreciate, and learn from each other's differences. Look to the congregational principle for answers. Encourage and underwrite experimentation. Trust children and families to know what is best for themselves. Stop the segregation of children and the aged in walled compounds. Involve everyone in every community in the education of the young. Business, institutions, old families, whole families, look for local solutions and always accept a personal solution in place of a corporate one. You need not fear educational consequences. Reading, writing, and arithmetic aren't very hard to teach if you take pains to see that compulsion and the school agenda don't short-circuit each individual's private appointment with themselves to learn these things. There is abundant evidence that less than a hundred hours is sufficient for a person to become totally literate and a self-teacher. Don't be panicked by scare tactics into surrendering your children to experts. Teaching must, I think, be decertified as quickly as possible. That certified teaching experts like me are deemed necessary to make learning happen is a fraud and a scam. Look around you. The results of teacher college licensing are in the schools you see. Let anybody teach who wants to. Give families back their tax money to pick and choose. Who could possibly be a better shopper if the means for comparison were made available? Restore the congregational system by encouraging competition after a truly unmanipulated free market model. In that way, the social dialectic can come back to life. Trust in families and neighborhoods and individuals to make sense of the important question, what is, in what is education for? If some of them answer differently from what you might prefer, that's really not your business, and it shouldn't be your problem. Our type of schooling has deliberately concealed the fact that such a question must be framed and not taken for granted if anything beyond a mockery of democracy is to be nurtured. It is illegitimate to have an expert answer that question for you. It was our own trust in our own potential that helped lay down good foundations back in the colonial period. I feel, certain that the, I feel certain that the structure we built then still houses powerful potential. Let's use it once again and create a truly American solution to the great school nightmare.